Hi, good afternoon everybody and welcome to um, yeah, welcome to this webinar. We're really looking forward to the conversation. Um, my name's Leanne. And my name is Lance. And we are both members of the Cheshire Collective. We are PhD students and this is part of a series of webinars by PhD students, for PhD students on a range of different topics. And today we are talking about decoloniality. Um, and what it means for health policy and systems research, and um, specifically asking how we resist. So we'll do um, roughly 50-50% of the time. First, uh, some inputs by myself and Lance. I'll outline what we mean by decoloniality, and Lance will then talk about uh, critical race theory and black consciousness. Um, and intersectional approaches to research, sorry. And then after that, we will have an open discussion. So I want to start by drawing on uh, Shose Kesi's work uh, to frame our conversation more broadly. She's from the field of critical psychology, um, she's a decolonial scholar, and this is from a talk she's done on decolonizing knowledge. So she proposes this decolonial framework for thinking and research that disrupts ideas of colonization. And um, she, kind of, she suggests that there are these three questions that we ask ourselves when doing this work. And these are, number one, um, how has the history of colonization shaped society? How do we reproduce that history? How do we resist? So how do we provide um, alternatives? Uh, Kessie's starting points here are to acknowledge and take on board three organizing principles to help us understand how colonization has shaped contemporary society. And these are racism, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. These, of course, intersect with each other. Um, and also allow for colonization to reproduce itself. So I think these are really helpful questions, um, and they very much see research as forming part of a social justice agenda. So we will come back to these in different ways later, later um, in the webinar, especially because they help us unpack some of the layers. Um, so there's the injustice of the, of the broader world, and a decolonial lens would argue that much of that has its roots in colonialism. But importantly, there's also the need to reflect on our own behaviours and practices and how we may, in our own work, in our own teams, knowingly or unknowingly, reproduce some of these colonial patterns. So Grosfewell talks about um, one of the most powerful myths of the 20th century as this idea that elimination of uh, the colonial administrators led to uh, decolonization of the world. He points out that the colonial power matrix is still very much a part of contemporary society. When a country gains independence from a colonial power, it doesn't mean that all the effects of colonialism automatically disappear. So coloniality is the condition that survives beyond the period of colonization. It's the invisible power structure that sustains colonial patterns of exploitation and domination. Uh, Maldonado Torres talks about how, as modern subjects, we breathe in coloniality all the time and every day. Um, Ratele talks about how we are all fish swimming in the sea of coloniality, trying to get out. So coloniality, then, in some ways, is a, is a diagnosis of modern-day society. Similarly, decolonization did not, in fact, could not have removed the effects of hundreds of years of colonial oppression. Decoloniality, then, is a political, epistemological, and economic liberation project aimed at dislodging coloniality and its manifestations. It's a praxis. It's an ongoing project. It's about ways of doing and ways of being in the world. So I want to pause briefly here and reflect on how decoloniality entered the popular discourse uh, in South Africa, at least. And I imagine that many of you um, joining today's webinar will either know about the student movement or were part of it in some way. And this was a student movement calling for free decolonial education in South Africa. For those who weren't, it was a nationwide campaign. Um, so, some say it started in 2015, although many would say it started before that. And these are pictures um, from UCT specifically. But it's important to recognize that there had been protests at other South African institutions for many years before that, and equally that there had been many protests and shutdowns at other institutions on the continent before that. 
In fact, uh, in fact, South Africa is the last country to gain independence. And so it has lots of lessons to learn from, from other countries on the continent. But the roads must fall, fees must fall, and outsourcing um, movement was largely sparked both by financial exclusions and the alienating culture of an historically white institution. Um, and it was an important moment politically that ultimately culminated in a, in a national shutdown. I think many will agree that it's this student movement that put the decolonization discourse into the popular media discussion, at least in South Africa. The movement has also influenced the strategic direction of the university. It's led to a decolonization agenda being centered as part of transformation, a call for decolonial research, which led to the establishment of the hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa, and a number of other things. Um, also shown here in these pictures are health sciences students engaging directly with the movement. So the picture there in the middle is, is a group uh, called Medics for Fees Must Fall, uh, a group of students and staff who stood in solidarity with the student movement and offered emergency medical care during the protests. And then on the bottom right-hand side, you can see um, a white sheet hanging from a balcony. Um, it says the Hamilton Nike Suite, and that's from a student occupation of, of the Dean Suite. And these are both, and many other moments, were very important politically because it was where health sciences students started to question both how the health system perpetuates colonial forms of violence, but also, importantly, critically questioned the role of the health system in society and seeing their role as, as a political act in and of itself. This is also not the first time in history we see those from the, from the health field joining the struggle. Biko himself was a medical student. Uh, Fanan, who was a psychiatrist, leaves the medical profession because for him it becomes futile to continue to heal people with mental illnesses only to return them to a fundamentally sick society. So we see many, many folks working in the field of health directly engaging with this field, uh, with, um, with this idea of decoloniality. Then over the last few weeks, we've seen the health policy and systems research community engage with the notion of decoloniality again in a series of tweets that critique a Gates-funded position in London seeking to establish a new network of health policy and systems researchers and an observatory for African health systems. So we hear here, I mean, we see here, sorry, we see Jilson asking why this is not based in Africa, why did the Gates Foundation not support the existing, growing um, African health policy and systems research people and networks. Um, Abimbola talking about how this is yet another example of colonial global health in the 21st century and saying you cannot uh, shave a man's head in his absence. We have uh, Tsofa calling for the end um, of this humanitarian aid mentality to African capacity building. We have the Chesai group asking in what ways an African health observatory based at LSE reproduces or disrupts colonial patterns of power and knowledge production. Um, Barasa talking about how problematic it is that um, London School of Economics um, is somehow presented as the custodians of the right knowledge and capacity as contrasted with the numerous amazing people on the continent, and Mariah agreeing with how this hegemony and privileging of particular forms of knowledge and the devaluing of others in, is in and of itself a form of coloniality. And then lastly, we have uh, this question um, being posed by uh, Aya Pong talking about are there any takers for establishing a network for European health systems policy, policies in uh, Makerere or Cape Town or Accra? So for those of you who haven't, um, who weren't following these sorts of debates, it's worth checking out the hashtag. There's lots of, lots of, um, that's a great conversation to, to be part of. Then we've also had some critiques of global health quite recently. So this is a paper from last week by Oni and colleagues outlining how global public health needs to start at home. And then there was also a Harvard student-led conference a couple of weeks a couple of weeks back, and a number of us joined that remotely actually, also critiquing critiquing global health. So decoloniality is getting a lot of airtime in many fields, including health. But it is of course not new. Um, it has its Many, many would argue that decolonial scholarship has its roots in South America, and we are drawing on some of these thinkers today. But as Lewis Gordon would, would say, a lot of this, um, a lot of this 
decolonial thought is quite Eurocentric. And in fact, we have many scholars on the continent who have been doing really important work in this area for, for many, many years. Um, Gordon would argue that Fanon's work is central. I think equally, though, it's important to acknowledge that there are many forms of decolonial work. Um, they are all legitimate. This is not about one, one form colonizing any other form of knowledge. And I guess you could also argue that there have been decolonial movements um, ever since the colonial encounter. People have always been resisting. I want to take us back to 1955, to the Badung Conference. And for those of you who, like me, had never heard of this conference, it was, really impor it was a really important event that brought together 29 African and Asian leaders specifically to discuss economic development and decolonization in 1955. Their agenda addressed race, religion, colonialism, national sovereignty, and the promotion of world peace. They defined development as a liberatory human aspiration to attain freedom from the political, economic, ideological, epistemological, and social domination that was installed by colonialism. So in this Bandung version, development entails overcoming those major obstacles to human happiness and attainment of material welfare. Um, what's happened subsequently is, is obviously quite complex, but I think it's worth contrasting these Badung um, principles with some of the principles that set the development agenda today. Next, I want, us to, want to take us to 1981 and uh, Ngugi Wa Tiongo. So he stops writing in English in 1981, in fact, um, after the publication of his highly acclaimed social critique, Decolonizing the Mind which he describes as his farewell to English as a vehicle for any of his writings. Six years later, um, he publishes Matigari, written in Gikuyu, and he does this because he believes that language is more than just a means of communication. He describes it as the medium of our memories, the link between space and time, and the basis of our dreams. His insistence on using his mother tongue as the principal medium of his writing is not simply a reaction against anglicization, it's much, more about, it's much more than that, and it's about resurrecting the African soul from centuries of slavery and colonization that left it spiritually empty, economically disenfranchised, and politically marginalized. He believes that when you erase a people's language, you erase their memory, and a people without memories are rudderless, unconnected to their own histories and culture. So what do we mean by decoloniality? And what, what can it offer us in, um, in our field of health policy and systems research? So this is a, an image by uh, Tsoko Maela, and I've included it here because he's an incredible artist who has quite literally been turning the lens or shifting the lens in his work, um, or shifting the gaze rather. Um, his work is a series of self-portraits where he documents his own experience of, of mental health, and it's an, I think, um, it's important, one, to recognize how art is a really important political tool for change, and two, how, how, how um, photography has been used in the continent in a very different way. So, for the rest of, of um, my, my bit of this webinar, I'm going to draw primarily on Glovo Gacheni's work and the three manifestations of coloniality. So, these are the coloniality of power, of knowledge, and of being. And I think this is a really helpful framework to think through a lot of decolonial ideas and how they operate at these, um, at these multiple levels. So coloniality of power is really about asymmetrical power relationships um, and all forms of domination, control, and exploitation. Mignolo describes this coloniality of power as a critical structuring process within global imperial designs, sustaining the superiority of the global north and ensuring the perpetual subalternity of the global south using colonial matrices of power. At the center of um, coloniality of power are these technologies of domination, exploitation, and violence, known, known as this colonial matrix of power, and they affect all dimensions of social existence. So this includes north-south divides, but it's also very important to move beyond these somewhat false binaries. It includes asymmetrical power relationships in our own teams and how race, gender, class, and other social stratifiers play out. Uh, Grossfugel outlines nine forms of 
domination or exploitation, which he finds um, as a finds to be a key part of this. And these are race, class, gender, sexuality, religion, ethnicity, political, military, epistemic, and linguistic. We could also think of many examples of how power hierarchies play out in the health system. So the most obvious one is the clinical hierarchies between doctors and nurses, say, or in some donor-funded programs, um, who, holds, who holds the power in those relationships, or equally in some global health research consortium, who sets the agenda? The coloniality of, of knowledge, then, um, is about the patterns of knowledge production and what knowledge is seen as a legitimate way of understanding the world. This is um, about the epistemological colonization of both the mind and their imagination, importantly. So at the core of decoloniality um, is the agenda of shifting the geography and the biography of knowledge. So who generates knowledge and, and from where? Um, there are a number of important examples here, but one historically significant one is the combinations, the use using the combinations of natural and human sciences to back up racist theories and to rank and organize people according to these binaries of inferior and superior relations. Or, again, specifically in the health system, we can think of the ways in which certain forms of knowledge dominate. So, again, certain understandings of science, or how certain forms of knowledge are considered to be more legitimate than others. So, um, epidemiology being considered more legitimate than what social science has to offer the field, for example. Then coloniality of being is the denial of the very humanity of African people and their inferiorization and dehumanization. Uh, Maldonado Torres talks about slavery, war, conquest, violence, rape, and even genocide constituted the way the colonial conquerors related to the colonized, and the ethics that governed human relations in Europe were somehow suspended in, in Africa. Then this is not uh, directly part of uh, Lovogatsheni's framework, but it's an important, an important one, um, and that is colonization of the mind. And Lance is going to pick up um, on this later when he talks, talks to us about black consciousness and specifically what Biko, um, what Biko meant by, by that. Um, but colonization of the mind really is about, it's about colonization of the imagination of the dominated, and it remains the worst form as it dealt and shaped people's consciousness and identity. So why think about decoloniality in HPSR? Well, it allows us to critique and possibly overcome some of the epistemological injustices put in place by these imperial global designs and questions and challenges some of the long-standing claims of Euro-American epistemologies to be universal, neutral, objective, disembodied, as well as being the only mode of knowing. It helps us recognize also that there is nobody who's able to escape the class, sexual, gender, spiritual, linguistic, geographical, and racial hierarchies that are fashioned by modern world systems. We also do want to reflect a bit, and Lance will pick up on some of this later, on, on some of the differences that um, HPSR has when compared to other global health disciplines. So HPSR has been doing a lot of work that tries to deconstruct power, for example, and look specifically at what other forms of knowledge can, can offer the field. So there, is a lot of, there are a lot of ways that HPSR has always sought to take on board many of these ideas without necessarily calling, um, calling, seeing it as part of the decolonial project. Um, I want to um, start finishing off then with a series of, of questions, and these are questions proposed by, by Kessie as well. Um, so there's a really excellent video, it's available on YouTube, um, and if you haven't seen it already, um, I'd very much recommend that. It's, it's a video where she talks about decolonial approaches to research on sexual violence. Um, so these are some questions from, from, that, um, from that body of work. And these are, how do we engage in work that disrupts ideas of epistemic violence? So why do this research? What is your agenda? What do you understand about the context of the, of the research? How do you know what questions to ask? What makes you the right person to do the research? What's your role in the research? So 
for me, for example, what does it mean? Um, what does it mean for me to be doing the kind of um, research that I do um, as a white female doctor working in the health system? How do I recognize whiteness and the other forms of privilege that I hold and try to disrupt these and still do good work that don't reproduce some of these colonial patterns um, of oppression? Also, how do we recognize the imperialism of the research endeavor in and of itself? and figure out ways that our work could disrupt or disrupt some of those hierarchies that we have discussed. So who will have access to your findings, for example? So I think, I think we do need to think of our decolonial work at three levels. So there is um, the importance of um, the important issue of global health as a neocolonial endeavor and global health consortiums and who holds the power. Um, things like safari or parachute research being unacceptable, and much of what was at the heart of that Twitter discussion. But then equally there are how power dynamics play out in our own teams, and how as individuals we engage, we, we engage in ways that either reproduce um, or disrupt some of, these, some of these patterns. So lastly, um, some of what I think this lens can offer us in this field is that it enables us to make visible some of the invisible ways in which power operates. It helps us to identify some of the underlying mechanisms that reproduce systems of oppression and helps us to think about researching methodologies and teaching praxis. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Lance, who will talk to us about uh, critical race theory, specifically black consciousness and intersectionality. Okay, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Leanne, for that solid framing of decoloniality and asking deeply reflective questions to engage our thinking about intentionality and scholarship. I'm going to continue by introducing two important frameworks that I'm proposing as being central to deepening our inquiry into decoloniality and research praxis, with the underlying assumption that research is political in nature and that research can contribute or facilitate social change. Um, and the theories can frame our, our thinking about strategies broadly, and I hope that these frameworks offer a basis for generative and collective thinking about what potential strategies for resisting may look like. These frameworks that I'm presenting is Black Consciousness Theory and Intersectionality Theory. But before I present these theories, I want to pose critical questions that can ground our understanding for why these theories may be useful. And so my, the first question I ask is, can we talk decolonization without talking about race? And what are the limitations of centering race and decoloniality discourse? In asking these questions, it is important to bear in mind that the history of health systems and health institutions are rooted in colonialist, including racist and sexist ideologies, and practices, and so as health, health policy and systems researchers and scholars, we need to note and understand the role that health systems and policies play in reinforcing and perpetuating colonial ideologies, and what are the implications um, are for colonized people. A third question is to be the second question links to the third question in that it recognizes the limitations of race, of centering race. So a follow-up question is, can we talk about decoloniality without talking about multiple interlocking forms of oppression, marginality, and vulnerability? And I raise that third particular question because of the potential dangers of just centering on one particular um, access of oppression and not recognizing intersectional frameworks, which I'll explain, explain later on. Let's start with critical race theory. And uh, critical race theory, based on the work of Biko and Fanon, which I integrate here in, in this presentation. And I'm going to start off with a quote by Hook that, um, and, and Hook writes about the psychopolitics of race. Um, where he integrates Biko and Fanonian ideas into unpacking what um, the relationship between the psychopolitics of race in relation to how we conceptualize critical race theory. 
And the critical orientation of race is to understand the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. And I think this statement is important in how do we how do we place the colonizer and how do we place the colonized. The colonizer for Hook is the colonial systems, the representations of peoples, places, spaces, and things, the hegemonic systems of dominance and subjugation, the centers of power and the health system itself as a system of power. And the Anne noted this earlier on um, when she framed issues of hierarchy and um, different ways of thinking about power in different spaces. And so the colonized relinks to the communities, the cultures, the beliefs, the practices, the peoples, as well as their subjectivities, right? And so critical orientation or critical race orientation is seeking to understand the relationships of domination and or resistance because recognizing that people have agency in these systems and not just passively um, receiving these different implications of dominance. But it goes further in, in, the, in the analysis or the inquiry into those relationships of domination and resistance with a critical and intentional foregrounding of the politics of, of identity and particularly racial identity. So what are the politics of racial identity? Racial categories of whiteness and blackness do not exist outside the colonial encounter and are mutually independent terms. The apparent superiority of whiteness requires the systematic devaluation of blacks. An example of this is um, research such as eugenics, as well as other ways in which research and scholarships was used to devalue not only the humanity, but also the capability of um, black subjects, colonial subjects. Um, and blackness is predicated on the fact of not being white. And so yeah, I make the argument that the focus on race is important as the colonial encounter was built on race differences in relation to domination. And so this colonial encounter causes internal disturbances by appropriating the means and resources of identity. And a quote by Fanon's Black Skin White Mask states that a normal black child who has grown up in the bosom of a normal family will be made abnormal by the slightest contact of whiteness. And so um, here we talk about white systems, colonial systems. And so in South Africa in particular within this context, in which scholarship, my scholarship is positioned, it is important to ask who are the majority of the bodies and subjectivities that use the public health care system and what are the politics of their identity, beliefs and practices in relation to that of the health system? And what's the nature of that relationship between um, people's subjectivities, black people's subjectivities in particular, and colonial institutions such as the health, the health, the health system? So what does, what does blackness mean for Biko in racial politics? And blackness for Biko is, it has come to represent not simply a skin color, but a form of solidarity, a collective form of hope and security, a way for black people to build up their humanity. And so the question is, how can, the, how can health systems and our research build the humanity of the people we serve? in health policy and systems research in particular, a lot has been done around people-centered health systems. And here I ask, who are the people in people-centered health systems in, in, in various and particular contexts? And what are the histories? What are their identities? What are their dreams? And what are their aspirations? And so for Biko, blacks are those who are by law or tradition, politically, economically, and socially discriminated against as a group within the South African society and who identi identify themselves as a unit in the struggle towards the realization of their aspirations. So understanding and contextualizing blackness in terms of racial, um, 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 racial identity politics, we begin to think about blackness as a form of liberation and centering black liberation in understanding our work as scholars within health systems 
um, and policy. And so black consciousness is, is really about this conscientizing process and the conscientization process that is a political strategy of resistance in which an attempt is made to develop a heightened awareness of oppressive political conditions of existence. And so we begin to challenge these ways, these particular power structures, these, these particular remnants of, of colonization within the health system through processes of conscientization. And this consciousness raising of black consciousness involves a component of historical redress, that black consciousness has to do with the correcting of false images of black people in terms of culture, health, education, religion, and economics. There's always an interplay between the history of people, the past and their faith in themselves and hopes for the future. We are aware of the terrible role played by our education, health, law, and religion in creating false image and understandings of black people and ourselves. And so, yeah, I propose that the interplay between the history and contemporary issues should be made visible when we conduct our scholarship. And one must immediately dispel the thought that black consciousness is merely a methodology or a means to an end. And I make the same argument for understanding and conceptualizing decoloniality. What black consciousness seeks to do is to produce at the output end of the process real black people who do not regard themselves as appendages to white society. It will always be a lie to accept white values as necessarily the best. And so in critiquing the health system, in understanding the health system and studying the health system, we need to understand how do we de-appendage ourselves from the ideals or the constructed ideals of whiteness. But what are the limitations of centering race in decoloniality discourse? And so in many experiences in civil rights movements in America in particular and in South Africa's liberation movements, we've seen how in centering issues of race in these liberation struggles, um, many women and black women in particular's experiences of marginality and oppression existed within those spaces. And more importantly, what are the experiences of black women and women of color that, that further dispossesses and marginalizes them in seeking black liberation? And so intersectionality and intersectional theory um, designed or conceptualized by Crenshaw and Collins in the US speaks about this interconnectedness of multiple identities and experiences. And so intersectionality gives us a framework for understanding how different identities and experiences relate to power and social structural oppressions, and that these experiences and these identities do not exist in isolation, but rather that understanding the social location is important in examining crisscrossing systems of oppression. Systems of inequality come together to position people in particular ways. And so race, class, gender, sexuality, etc., form mutually constructing features of social organization which shapes people's lived experiences. And so personal experiences are reflections of power relations which gives you the social structural oppressions that continue within power hierarchies. Intersectionality also challenges political assumptions. Example, that all women and men are gendered beings and are equally oppressed. What about the differences in race, class, sexual orientation within these genders? And it challenges binary thinking. So for example, we can think of men as being oppressed by virtue of their location in terms of race, class, and sexual orientation, but women would be differently positioned in those same categories and axes that come together. The concept of intersectionality encourages gender analysis approach of all gender dimensions with an anti-oppression framework which recognizes that gender oppression can interact with multiple forms of oppression, including but not limited to race, class, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, sexuality, ability, language, age, etc. And that race, in the same way that gender, 
cannot be isolated from other intrinsic identities or social experiences, rather gender interact with these factors. And so there's a quote from Audre Lorde, who's also been quite influential in writing about intersectional experiences, is there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And so the people accessing health systems do not live um, single issue lives. And how are we responsive in our research and how are health systems responsive to these interconnectedness of different subjectivities that result in different issues of access to to, to services and treatment within within the health system. And how do these how do these social positionings that intersect um, govern the experiences and the relationship of the health system and people? And so just to just to give an example is understanding the experiences of white gay men would be very different from understanding the experiences of black queer women or black lesbian women, for example, um, within a South African context. So understanding that these the needs will be different, the health issues will be different, and it's merely although these two groups share the same um, and and collective experiences of having a marginal sexuality, race and class intersect to create very different experiences. And so, as health systems and policy um, researchers, we need to think about how do we or can we respond to the current health systems issues in ways that centers black liberation and intersectionality in our praxis. How do we how do we intentionally do this, but also in ways that is actually quite practical? And can we, and should we center black liberation and intersectionality? when we are positioned differently in relation to blackness and other forms of oppression as health policy and systems scholars, how do we deal with these varying proximities and what will be the consequence of this? So an example of this is that I'm queer, I identify with a marginal um, sexuality, but I'm also black within a South African context, but I'm also a male body that gives me particular access and particular privileges that definitely won't be the same as women. So how am I differently positioned, but able to do this work in ways that are responsive to the issues of, of black women? And so decoloniality and HPSR, I here present ways in which we can think about um, strategizing, but also think about what um, what, what are the ways in which we reflect on how we could be resisting as scholars? And the first suggestion I make is that we need to build a critical awareness of the role that systemic institutional and political factors or these relations of power play within the domain of the health system, in the domain of scholarship and where the health system and research intersect or connect. The second suggestion is that health policy and systems research is a critical orientation that offer us approaches and strategies for this work. So for example, HPSR already explicitly values the contributions of social science. And so decoloniality could offer us an approach to take this further. How do we find those opportunities in health systems, health policy and systems research for taking our work further. And so a decolonial lens could offer us this to think deeply about our work. The third suggestion is that knowledge in the process of learning cannot be separated from everyday life. And that constantly evolves through the contributions that people make based on their lived experiences. It is the daily lives, experiences, and activities of people that inform scholars on what actions can be effective in disrupting their oppression. And transformative actions are dependent on the context in which people live. And understanding the relationship between context and people's experiences is of utmost importance. And therefore, the researcher should be a facilitator of social change. And that research is constructed by praxis. And this is a quote by a by research and scholarship through um, Kesi and Bunzaya, who reflects that they cannot deliver solutions to the problems of the oppressed. 
but can assist people in the process of achieving the changes that they seek. Community partners and marginal people are experts of their own lives and are most knowledgeable about the challenges they face and the aspects of their daily lives that need to change. However, due to the lack of resources and the exclusion from centers of power, they can become fatalistic or submissive in their situation. And so as scholars, how do we reflect on our role in facilitating this process of social change but still centering the voices of marginal and the experiences of marginal people. And so the fifth suggestion is how do we then center interlocking marginal subjectivities and resistances in HPSR, linking health policy and systems research issues with politics of identity and positionality in critical ways. And this is where I end off um, my thinking and my framing for how we strategize around um, um, resisting um, coloniality in different ways and forms that it plays out. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're now going to open up for a more general discussion and we're really looking forward to, yeah, to hear your thoughts on all of these on all of these issues. Um, as I said earlier, we are using, using decoloniality as a way of thinking through a number of issues in our work. Um, we aren't decolonial scholars in that expert kind of way, but we are finding a lot of these approaches really helpful, and so we hope, we hope that you will too. But mostly we're really looking forward to hearing your views and um, yeah, what, what you think from where you sit. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lance and Leanne, uh, for that rich uh, presentation. It's such a, a complex uh, topic. And I feel like we, uh, you've, you've shared uh, uh, quite an extensive, uh, detailed information, which we could probably break up into, you know, a series of uh, sessions on decoloniality. Uh, now it's time for uh, inputs from participants, and I just want to invite you to to share uh, your ideas. Your hands, please, if anyone has uh, any ideas to share on the topic or any concerns or, or if you're seeking any clarity on the presentations uh, Leanne and Lance uh, presented, uh, please, uh, you're welcome. If I may start, uh, excellent presentation, I learned quite a lot, uh, but the issue with uh, decolonization, which I always have, uh, is that it's such a I feel like it's an ambitious project that needed uh, to be done. Uh, and usually the focus is on uh, making these structural, uh, large-scale uh, changes in a relationship. And we always think of you know, countries and institutions. Uh, we tend to forget uh, that we, uh, as you know, agents, as actors, uh, have quite a lot to do and if you think of institutions or countries they're make up of you know uh, people and, and and I like the uh, ideas that you shared Leanne about uh, different ways of understanding uh, mm -hmm. the uh, coloniality in terms of power knowledge and being uh, that I feel like is quite a helpful uh, framework to kind of question uh, how uh, you are or how you relate to others, or how you approach your work, uh, and also to look to look, you know, into these power uh, inequalities and, and and your ideas about you know what you know and how you come to know those things and questioning those are uh, I feel like they are great starting mm -hmm. points, mm -hmm. and, and as a PhD student, uh, the kind of gives uh, a great clarity to sort of approach this quite complex uh, topic. Uh, so I, I find that very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Walter. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. Those, so those are uh, Lovo Gacheni's framings, and he draws on a lot of scholars pulling those together. But I, I also find them quite helpful, because it is, I guess, to keep we, yeah, for me at least, the, re the reminder is that we're all complicit in, 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 um, in a world order that is fundamentally unjust. 
And mm. so it is about reflecting on the ways in which as individuals we perpetuate these um, injustices as well as speaking truth to power collectively and mobilizing mm. against things. But it's, I don't know, for me what, what, what he draws out that I find very helpful is thinking about decoloniality at these different levels. Mm. I guess the other, the other thing to add is there are other scholars who frame decoloniality differently, um, especially scholars from the field of black feminism that mm -hmm. take a very different framing. And so I guess even now, the loudest voices in this conversation are men, actually. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a scholar in Jaru Kulundu who also has, has done some of this, actually some of her work's online as well, and she really frames decoloniality as a possibility for change. Mm -hmm. So like you said, well, there, but... It's, it's this huge term, there's all these massive structures which seem unbudgeable, and mm -hmm. she kind of talks about this lens offering us the possibility for things to be different, which I think is another really useful way of, of framing it. Afternoon everyone, my name is Nualisa Drama, I'm a, a first year PhD student based here at the uh, Health in UWC. I am very happy that I attended this webinar. Um, thank you for keeping on reminding us. And the reason I'm quite happy um, for, for a, since I decided to do my PhD on this topic without going on onto the topic. I actually wondered whether there is space or, or in the area of health because I'm um, also like you all, um, Lance, come from a psychology background. Mm -hmm. And when I shared my topic with people on the fact that I want to, um, to find out whether they are um, a collaboration with traditional health practitioners and mental mm -hmm. health, um, everyone, maybe you are not. Um, least well, you should, maybe you should be in psychology mm. because the conversation is going. So I wondered if there is even discussion of this that you mentioned mm -hmm. in the health system because mm -hmm. from where I I I I am sitting, it looks like that that work for the current department department is quite worrying considering the fact that the health system. Different kind of race, the class. Um, for, I understand we have pharmacy department work very well with these um health pro, um, uh, practitioners from 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 the different systems. However, that work is only to case of their work. Is, um, work the, the, the practitioners are doing. Um, for me, what you just said, the point you made, um. Uh, mm -hmm. That the society know what their problems know what the issues are, how mm -hmm. to uh, solve them, but the fact is that it's access, the quality. Then, yeah. in South Africa, in institution, in island institution, I feel like the actual departments um, actually know to make in terms of the knowledge that actually disrupts mm -hmm. the system. So. The point I want to make. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. For the, for the, um, and, I, and I think that it's so important to also recognize that the, that without necessarily calling reality, mm. there has been a lot of work to resist power relations. And I think that that's quite important because I, and we know that mm. as a field and as an emerging field, um, really there's an orientation to of power think about systems changing right Please. and so and I see that um, Aisha referred to um, Asha um, embedded systems as of of PSR work around embedded systems and how it, it speaks to decoloniality the role of the research planning the relationship between the researcher and systems actors facilitate a process consciousness and research and it would be interesting to look at at areas of embedded research um, as a, as a new as a same standing decoloniality features methodology right? question but that
really nice input yeah I've got a couple of typed in here which I, um, everybody remotely can't see so we'll read some of those out but also if you are yeah if you are on the line um yeah also I think you just press that little hand button and yeah then you can question as well we'll read out some of the questions and if you are struggling yeah to then just let us know on the chat So here's a question about systemic violence. Um, so what is systemic violence? I believe, for examples, can you give an example of the system that is colonial and that is clearly evident? Do you want to take that one, Lance? I mean, the, the history, you're going to have to help me a little bit brain is a little fried because <laughs> in terms of it's, it's very confusing uh, for us to like yes, manage, to the manage the all input. of these things yeah <laughs> so um i'll evidence. give an example yeah, then. yeah. yeah so i guess i guess for me for me there's a lot of ways in which the health system is very clearly colonial in how in how power is so so the health system at least i mean so I, I train clinically and it very much is a paternalistic system where a healthcare worker holds all of the knowledge and tells people to look after their own health. And of course, there are clinicians who who break this down, break this hierarchy down. But overall, that that is kind of a lot of how a lot of the health system is set up in a way um, of healthcare up and down wards, often wearing white, making all the decisions while patients sit in their beds waiting to be told what to do. If you missed anything, you as someone who's disrupting the ward round mm -hmm. so for me for me the practice of of medicine is very much like that and um when i was at that medical school we didn't think about other forms of knowledge the training that i got was very centered around western ideas of mm -hmm. what health and medicine are even though i studied in a country where the majority of people don't actually use that healthcare um system as mm -hmm. so i think there are other subtle ways but for obvious ways um, that the health system, I, from where I sit at least, still mm -hmm. seems to be quite quite colonial in nature. Mm -hmm. Shall I read out this one? Mm -hmm. um, so community health worker research is marked by various epistemic hierarchies framing the types of research undertaken. Uh, whose perspectives they take on board and how the research is done despite huge amounts of funding thrown at it. Um, so that's, let me just see, that's a, a comment coming from Asha George. Mm -hmm. um, Tanya asks, I would be also interested in taking conversations forward on intersectionality in HBSR, both conceptually and in practices, reflecting on my own research. and. Yes, Tanya, I mean, we had a lot of conversations as scholars within the field. Tanya is also doing a PhD uh, with us in, with Chesai. And so I think, I mean, I merely uh, scraped the, the, the surface with intersectionality as, as, as a framework and a, and, a, and, a, and a framework for praxis. But I definitely think that it's, it's, there's an important kind of learning and, 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 and lessons that intersectionality can get us in scholarship and framing our research praxis. So definitely agree with that. And I'm hoping that um, it sparks a little interest for us to, 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 to think about strategies more concretely. Um, because everyone's always thinking about decoloniality that says that decoloniality exists in the abstract. I think that's a myth. I think that um, for me, decoloniality is something that it's an, it's an orientation, it's a way of thinking about the world, it's a way of understanding the world, but it's also the way we do, right? Which, it, and, and, and comes from that kind of um, um, heightened level of awareness and building that level of awareness to be able to inform the ways in which we, we conduct research, but also understanding the consequences of what we do. Yeah. Um, I just want to go back to the earlier question. Um, that we actually didn't address this question of what is epistemic violence. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a question from, um, I think you pronounce it Yakai. Um, 
I guess epistemic violence or epistemicides are, is this notion of what, what knowledge gets produced and how that is viewed as legitimate or not. So um, what, what, what knowledges are in health are seen as legitimate forms of knowledge. So for example, uh, the lived experience of people using healthcare systems are obviously not seen as legitimate when contrasted with the statistical numbers of um, immunization coverage, for example. So it's this idea that some are valued more than others. And so epistemic violence is violence against forms of knowledge and ways of thinking and ways of producing knowledge. And so um, many people will consider this at the very heart, actually, of, of, of decolonization, at least what I understand yeah. by epistemic violence. Yeah. Do you guys have something to but add? But it's, it's also, I mean, the epistemic violence is also the violence linked to the, um, really, the delegitimization of African indigenous forms of knowledge. And I think it's, it's, it's the kind of of, of of violence that's that's perpetuated um, literally through the psyche that operates at a psyche level to rob people of their ways of knowing and understanding the world. Um, but I also think the consequence how then these the kind of these dominant forms of knowledges then create or perpetuate forms of violence. Um, or, or yeah, so 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 being able to if if I use a, a, a Sorry, there's another distraction, and I'm not sure what the issue is. Okay, so so um, yeah, so what 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 are the consequences if we think about gender-based violence, for example, um, and struggles of gender-based violence is strongly linked to ideas of knowledge. What knowledges are being legitimized and what knowledges are not, and so and who who whose experiences are being centered, right? Whose experiences, whose ways of thinking about these issues are being centered? Who's are not, right? And so it's quite interesting that last year with the total shutdown, we saw this president trying to respond to, to new ways of thinking about gender-based violence, where women and, 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 and um, women from different, and I use this um, obviously from, with an intersectional approach, women generally and women with an X or trans woman included, is trying to present ways of addressing issues of violence through understanding that the experiences is a legitimate form of knowledge and that knowledge should inform policy and it should influence the system. So it's that kind of violence. It's, that, it, it, it's, the con, it's also the consequence of, of the, le, the delegitimization of certain knowledges that then results in violence, in further violence. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a bit of a, a question, you know, something that uh, I came across uh, quite uh, often when it comes to, you know, discussions about decoloniality. Many people uh, push back on the idea uh, or reject the idea as, as uh, very uh, ambitious, impossible, uh, because uh, they tend to, to equate decoloniality with, with the rejection of uh, anything and everything that's, that's waste, uh, that's white, that's from the nose, uh, but uh, in reality, uh, and from your presentations, uh, what I uh, kind of uh, get is it's, it's not necessarily uh, that it's about uh, giving uh, uh, knowledge uh, f from the south or, uh, or or marginalized groups, their mm -hmm. their rightful place, bringing them to the center, and uh, and treating them in in, in an equal uh, footing. Mm -hmm. uh, and what comes to uh, mind, and that that I think is very relevant in this conversation, is it's acknowledging diversity mm -hmm. uh, of knowledge uh, and value systems, mm -hmm. and and treating. Uh, all uh, in on equal basis, as you have indicated, mm -hmm. Lance. Uh, there's no uh, value or knowledge system that you can uh, objectively get to the place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also uh, bring into the center knowledge uh, from that locality when it comes to uh, informing uh, how we do things in that particular context. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's quite a common myth or misperception about what reality is. That it's anti-white, um, that it's anti-everything from the West, and that really is not what it is. Mm. You know, I mean, it's it's about recognizing that at the moment those those things take up way too much space, mm. basically. Mm. So it's about it's about centering other and recognizing them as equally legitimate as mm. some of those ideas. And it is a common common myth. And I think in the beginning and still now, it's why it's it. At least in the institutions, um, it was an idea that made people very uncomfortable, you mm. know, um, and there was a lot of pushback against it. But it, as you say, Wilde, I mean, I think that's an excellent summary. Mm. It's about it's about recognizing all forms of knowledge as, as legitimate. Mm. So it's about pluriversities, not universities. Mm. You know, it's, it's it really is about that. And um, adding on into that, um, we should be we should be cognizant of 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 the fact that the methodologies that we are using in, in finding out uh, or in doing research uh, might not necessarily be um, suitable forms of methodology when you want to study other forms mm -hmm. of practices mm -hmm. and knowledge. I know this, for example, that there's a lot of um, clinical trials that are going around on, okay, this is the medicine that we want to, to, to check. So let's use a clinical trial and I know a lot of practices and methods of other healers for example um, there is actually no way that you can study evidence because the ways of the how they are approaching healing or how they are approaching treatment of patient mm -hmm. is more holistical and more spiritual mm -hmm. so um, those are some of the things that um, mm -hmm. when in, in terms of, of recognizing the fact that there is a, a bit of inequality or a bit of power mm -hmm. um, that um, the other when you want to, 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 to study the other system mm -hmm. there are issues um, and then adding on 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 the fact that uh, on what you mentioned um, really about the power um, in terms of your your field in, in medicine I have a question on how do we then get policy makers to recognize the that uh, the fact that the health system is really operating mm -hmm. uh, in a very colonial um, uh, space or mm -hmm. in a very colonial, it still has um, the history of coloniality is still very much embedded mm -hmm. in the health system. How do we then get the policy makers um, to be able to to disrupt the system, mm -hmm. in fact, in terms of delivering uh, health to our communities? Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, we have. Um, thanks for that. Um, was there a question in there as well? Hmm. No, okay. Um, so we've got some questions um, from some people on the line. Um, let me just see how we unmu unmute you. Um, we have Eleanor and, and Aaron both um, both with questions. Uh, so Eleanor, I think, I think go ahead. I think we should be able to hear you. Thanks. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Um, thanks for that. Those are both really interesting um, presentations. I missed the first bit of Leanne's because I had technical difficulties, which turned out to be just me being stupid, but I figured it out. Um, I, was, I, I really enjoyed the presentations, and it got me thinking quite a lot about, I think it was um, Leanne who said uh, that part of decoloniality is about thinking about our own role in reinforcing the sort of uh, knowledge and power hierarchies that we're a part of and specifically thinking about our role in how we do that through our work and then maybe also how we try to not do that through our work um, and uh, but I think so one of the kind of methodological or epistemic challenges of any type of systemic violence is that it's very difficult to see in isolated incidents it exists in as as a larger trend as a system as a, a sort of network of patterns and that's what makes it difficult to study i guess mm. um but then also what got me thinking about this originally was it's sort of social media and how since the emergence of social media there's been an emergence of language to describe uh, different uh, sort of power plays like I was thinking about the terms gaslighting and the term mansplaining mm. so two words that sort of emerged out of a collective discussion that came out of 
like a you know a, lots of people sharing their individual experiences and then collectively identifying patterns um and so i thought i would just made me think about if that's something that as a hpsr or like a global health research community if part of our role then is to try and develop the language for naming the kind of harmful patterns that we see in such a way that you know that future researchers don't have to do that groundwork they don't have to collect that trend data they can see the pattern and name it because you know you've got a terminology for it mm-hmm. and maybe that's yeah just one way to think about what we can do as researchers yeah, great. Thanks, Eleanor. That's that's a um, yeah, that's a great point. We've actually got quite a couple of people online now. So what we're going to do is take a round of comments and questions, and then those of us in the room will will reflect back. So thanks so much for that, Eleanor. Um, Adam. Yeah, I'm just yeah. Sorry, this is just now in the order, not of your questions, but just on the list. So, um, Adam, please go ahead. <laughs> yes, we can. Well, thank you again for this this wonderful um, uh, event and uh, presentation. I mean, I've learned a lot today, and I think that um, you've everyone should be commended for raising this issue, which is kind of at the point where we're at right now in health policy and systems research is reflecting as a, a community of practice. And I I mean, one of the questions I constantly have is I think you I think that there's a lot of attention around this. And, you know, as we move the conversation forward, um, what are some of the things we can do to, to help people understand a little bit more about this, this area? So whether it's actually forming a, a community of practice, um, you know, there's all sorts of research guidelines for different protocols for studies. Maybe there needs to be uh, some sort of checklist for this. Um, for those that are interested in conducting research, um, maybe a, a course or a training that could be rolled out for different types of audiences. Um, statements at a conference, like a declaration or some sort of statement, um, or an event in itself. And I know that these are small things, and this is something that's much more systemic and kind of profound than like a checklist. Um, but these do kind of help people understand uh, you know, where the consensus lies and how to reflect then on their practice as they're you know, um, engaging with uh, their own work. Um, and there is different kind of audiences which may need different kinds of messages. For example, funders, researchers themselves, as well as um, how researchers and research participants interact um, would be one way to think about it going forward. Um, but um, I think that this is really an interesting topic and one that um, I hope that, you know, we can reflect more on at, at my institution at Johns Hopkins University. Mm. Thanks again. Thanks, Great. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, yeah, Kai, please, please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, once again, I'd like to say thank you so much for the presentation. I found it very informative. And um, I'm calling from the from Zimbabwe. Uh, I recently joined the Social Medicine Consortium and I'm a representative for the chapter in Zimbabwe, Center for Health, Healthy Equity in Zimbabwe. So some of the issues that you've been discussing here and all the points that have been pointed out, it's, um, it's some of the things that we are also working on back here in Zimbabwe. We have our organizing statement where we are looking at the colonial legacy and its effects on the healthy system in our country. So I really did find this uh, quite helpful. And um, just to uh, address some of the questions that um, some of the panelists were asking um, um, on how do you engage uh, policy makers. So there is one of the tools that we use um, uh, through the social medicine consortium where we get to train uh, representatives from different chapters around the world. So um, just briefly about the social medicine consortium, uh, it's founded by Dr. Kamara Joseph in the USA, but there are several chapters around the world from Africa in the US of people who are working on 
campaigns um, against um, racism and social injustices. So I think it's um, one of the organizations that you can link up with to understand how they are managing the situation that they are facing in the countries and to also help you in strategizing and putting the engage and move on in yeah, addressing some of the issues that have been pointed out here. So in terms of engaging the policy makers, um, I think uh, it's, it starts oh, with the, uh, with identifying what actually, um, how do I put this across? Uh, identifying the, the problem that we want to to encounter and uh, finding out the root causes in relation to the uh, colonialism. So I asked earlier of a precise example of how the, uh, the effects of colonialism in the healthy system that are still evident. So that some of those that you pointed out, that we are working on the book and that you could work on. Maybe identifying the resources that you have that you can manipulate to progress yourselves and probably put up a paper that can be addressed to policy workers, uh, policy makers, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then concerning the methodologies, um, I do not think there's one specific methodology that can work for every situation. So like what has been presented earlier, uh, people in different sectors or in different communities have got knowledges and experiences of the effects of colonialism. So if you start conversations on those issues and you get the specific um, effect that are affecting people, that can be worked out from, uh, from the people within the communities and how they, uh, how they can encounter that. So methodologies can vary depending on the issue and the community and uh, the impacts on that and different people in the spectrum. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, so who in the room would like to reflect um, or respond to any of those questions? So I definitely think that um, there are very useful strategies, and I'm speaking more to Eleanor's reflection as well as Adam's reflection. I definitely think that languaging is important. So I think that uh, the suggestion of HPSR scholars developing language, I mean, the health system as a complex adaptive system is part of, is part of and, that, and then that's why in, while I was talking, I was reflecting on our current achievements as, health, as HPSR as a field in addressing some of these of these issues coming from 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 yeah from, from reflecting on very traditional public health responses um, um, in relation to health, systemic health systems and policy responses there's definitely a, a, a there's value in health systems um, and policy research as a field to be able to think about um, about this work deeply um, and and I think that there, there's there's definitely I mean um, Adam um, raised really nice kind of concrete but yet small ways in which we can do this work and I think that that's that's the work it's embedded in the language the way in which we un understand ourselves and it's constantly opening up these spaces opening up this conversation for us to be deeply reflective about our role but also the field our contribution to the field but more importantly our contribution to the issues and the people affected by the issues i think that's for me the most the crux of of what we do that we constantly um are in consultation with the people most affected and in south africa it happens to be particular individuals with particular identities and i think that that's quite important to consider yeah uh, uh, also, maybe related to the question Adam uh, raised, and I can see Tanya also talking about uh, the recent uh, conference that was held at, at uh, my university, University of Western Cape, on uh, decolonizing psychology. And on that, I would like to add that you know this 
uh, the liberation on the coloniality, uh, maybe it's something uh, emerging in HPSR, uh, but, but I feel like there are uh, similar conversations that have already been happening in other disciplines, uh, psychology being one. Uh, and this uh, conference that was held here uh, was uh, attended by uh, scholars, some of them uh, Leanne mentioned in her presentation. And the uh, records of that uh, conference are uh, freely available on YouTube. Uh, perhaps we would, link, would share the link to, to that uh, as part of you know, this, this webinar. Um, great, I'll make a quick reflection and then um, we've got uh, um asking a question and a question that Fidel actually made um, earlier. So first, just a brief reflection. So I don't know exactly. I mean, I think I think it is part of our revo our role to develop some of that language. I mean, Lance, as as you pointed out, and it is precisely because um, these the ways in which this is so invisible that it's important to do that. And I guess I feel like like decoloniality offers us a lens to make some of that visible. Um, then. Yeah, Adam, I mean, exactly, what can we do? What, what does a community of practice look like? What are we already doing as well, um, reflecting on that? Um, at the Health Systems Global meeting, so at the, at, um, at the symposium last year, there was actually a really active discussion about this exact issue as well, and lots of people putting, yeah, putting, some he putting heads together to think about it in all kinds of different ways. Um, so I think there is a lot happening. And Lance, as you pointed out, it is worth reflecting on, on how this field is somehow different from global health more broadly and yeah. does try to push back against some of those and has for a long time actually yeah. and just didn't necessarily call it um, some kind of decolonial praxis but yeah. for example I mean the, the um, you raised the incredibly valuable contributions of social science to this mm -hmm. field so that's something that that HPSR has really centered in its approaches um, also to reflect on some of the questions about methodologies and policy makers part of the high down the in, this kind of in the invisible wall between policymakers and researchers as if they are somehow different different creatures when in fact many of us wear multiple hats and we have a couple of examples here um, where we do break down those walls and I think that one way is to write a paper of some kind but the other is to share ideas and to find ways in which you can engage that are mutually beneficial to be sharing sharing ideas about the same health system that we're all working working towards so there's multiple ways we can engage and are engaging some of the methodologies we've been looking at are, um, are things that bring the, bring the experiences of people into the policy discussion mm -hmm. um, in a way that researchers often fail to do. So I think there's, there, are lots, there are lots of things we're doing in lots of ways and it's, it's great to be having this conversation so that we can cr be critiquing those ways as well. Um, great. So we have a question from Fidel that I'm just going to read out and then uh, I'm going to hand over to you. So the question from Fidel is a bit depressing. <laughs> um, he says, are we not engaging in a lot of battle? Is this even achievable? Um, would the powerful be ready enough to compromise? So I'm going to leave that there for us all to chew on. And Klingiwe, um, you go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. And um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a reflection, but I was just thinking about um, what Lance and Leanne have talked about in terms of knowledge being power and who decides which issues are important and which issues are not important. And I was thinking about us as researchers and how we black or white or colored, how we actually go to these communities and extract the data and use it for and we don't take it back to the people to actually be able to reflect on the information and decide if that's how they want to be represented or if that's an issue they want to take forward or if that's even a no, like knowledge which they can use and in that i mean in the way that we actually uh where we publish how we publish the language that we use which still keeps them as the outsider and we become their gatekeepers mm -hmm. instead of being employed by the people to represent their issues and what they want. 
So, yeah, as I said, I'm not sure if it's a question or just a mm. reflection in terms of how how we contribute and what we're trying to decolonize also. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Lingua. Um, I mean, linked to that is we also, we cannot be naive to think that the institutions in which we exist in are not structured in particular ways, right? So if I think about us that's located within academic institutions, the academy is structured in a particular way that obviously determines the actions that I take and the relationships kinds of relationships that I value and build and the kinds of people that I that I want to engage with and, it, and it's going to be naive to think that that um, that we can completely resist that system in overthrowing it right so um, but there are I think my argument is that there are opportunities and it's about imagining those opportunities and finding those opportunities um, and 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 I think there's a there's a link between the kind Kinds of spaces that we open up for this conversation and the kinds of institutional and structural shifts that's needed um, and so and one example is the student movement the kinds of conversations the kind of critical mass that was built between students to black students in particular trying to foreground the experiences and the institutional shift in the conversations at higher at higher level that has in that in that has really inspired it and I mean it's a continuous journey um, and I think that we should we should acknowledge that it's a continuous, it's a process of change um, rather than event of change. And I think that's also something that we need to consider constantly as we're reflecting on this. Yeah, I think I want to add on in the fact that uh, in also trying to answer Fidel's question, um, that really it is a process. It's coming from looking. Yeah. Okay. So we're just um, muting muting some loud noises and finding the question again. Now, uh, yes, I was adding on what Lance was saying that it really is a process and not like an event. And uh, would the powerful be ready to compromise? Well. To, to to us because as practitioners or as researchers we are guided by certain um, acts for example we are guided by um, the Bill of Rights mm -hmm. and what is um, we need to be co cognizant of the fact that we are serving the communities and their right is that they I have to have access to to care to equal care they have to they have to have access to the care that they would like to to access and if um in terms of south africa i feel like uh, the government has a big role to play in terms of really scrapping away the legacy of colonialism and mm -hmm. um the journey is slow but i feel like we should not be disheartened by the fact that it's slow and mm -hmm. it's a process and ultimately we will get there in the process as the tools because as researchers we are the tools mm -hmm. as the tools we, we need to have these conversations and be aware of our roles and be aware of the little roles that can we can play to disrupt these systems that we also um, find ourselves in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean I, I agree I think I, I also for me um, I'm hopeful I guess you know mm -hmm. I think that conversations like these um, they do offer us different ways of doing things and small ways in which we can disrupt some of these patterns and I do think also we, we it's important it is important to keep reflecting on how rapidly some things have changed even though it's only conversation at this point you know if we think in South Africa for for decades we've been talking uh, rainbow nationism mm -hmm. you know that's no longer the the popular narrative actually mm -hmm. you know like um, so People are all of us as a people are no no longer happy to expect to sort of um, to accept peace at the expense of justice and mm -hmm. so I guess the danger is sometimes we talk in echo chambers and mm -hmm. so we talk in universities about breaking down some of these uh, mm -hmm. injustices but I guess yeah I, I do I think I think the ways in which especially people engaged in social movements mm -hmm. are working on these issues very thoughtfully very critically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, 
pa- these power structures are incredibly difficult to break down, definitely, undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. There's no, no reason to be sort of naively hopeful about things. Mm-hmm. But um, I do think there are ways. And I guess what, what, we, what we need to ask ourselves is, as, as researchers in this field, what are the ways that we can do that, which is kind of why we wanted to have this conversation today. Mm-hmm. So we have sort of five minutes left, um, everyone. Who would like to, anybody, either either from wherever you are around the world or in the room, anybody who would like to make some closing comments? I think I'll kickstart us. And I think for me, what's, what's fundamentally is also realizing that, and that's linked to Copano Ratele's um, statement about we are all swimming in the sea of colonization, of colonialism, right? We're all still swimming. It would, I mean, I have to recognize that my psyche has been colonized in particular ways. Um, mm-hmm. I respect some forms of power. I operate within certain institutions, and that has that ha- that governs the way I operate in. And and so it is important to to first of all recognize and understand that, and then. I think the, and it's about researching, it's about understanding the colonial project. I don't think we can talk about decoloniality without naming and understanding the the colonial project and also understanding what are the issues, what are the problems about the colonial project within its history, but also in the current that that is problematic, right? What, What is it that we are struggling with? And what is that legacy? What is the problem with that legacy? Um, and I don't think people get that that but that issue of that colonialism is a fundamental problem. Slavery like, links to you know the kinds of sexual violences, the disruption of black communities and communities everywhere. And I use black because of the context that I'm speaking from. Um, the 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 rearrangement of social of of societal stratifications to be able to to favor one group over the other is and we still see that so it's important for us to recognize the problems of colonialism and to be able to name it confront it and then seek to imagine how do we how do we how do we change it um I, I just like to say um, I'm not usually this vocal, so it really speaks to how excited I am to 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 be um, to join this webinar, and I'm actually very excited that you you were brave enough to to take this conversation uh, from the uh, recognizing that it, it is mostly rooted or it's contributor it, it, it they are contributor it's the social science to bring it in this. Um, in this form of of setting and it really made me think about um the research project that i'm embarking on which is gonna be really a long and sometimes a lonely journey it's affirming to know that there are people who are also have are thinking about these frameworks are thinking about this mm-hmm. kind of work in our communities so it is really being this conversation is really for me it's, it's not gonna stop here it's really gonna make me think about the kind of route that I want to take for my PhD, will I be affirming the Western knowledge or will I be contributing in also um, uh, bringing about the voice in terms of indigenous ways of treating certain um, illnesses in our communities and how we should be going on about and working together as these two systems. So I am um happy that I joined and um, hopefully uh, there will be another platform where we'll be continuing with this kind of um, conversation. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much everyone. We've come to the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, I just want to uh, extend my appreciation and huge thank you to Leanne uh, and Lance uh, for uh, leading us uh, in this very important conversation. Uh, this webinar is part of the Chesai and School of Public Health UWC led initiative to support uh, doctoral students uh, in their endeavor to understand uh, complex concepts like decolonization and intersectionality. Usually we have this conversation amongst us and this is probably the first time we open it up to to a bigger audience and clearly 
uh, it is richer uh, because of that. And uh, we have these webinars every uh, two months. Uh, we hope uh, to have you uh, on uh, subsequent uh, webinars as well. Thank you for your inputs and uh, your process. Uh, yeah, all the best. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay.